Uh, hello and welcome back to the spreadsheet. Skunkworks, the series where we try to build a chess computer in Excel and learn as much as we can about VBA along the way. Straight into the download file this time, as usual, the download files are available from the website. I want to start with this file, which I've called a preparatory file. I uploaded this earlier this week and we've got to the point where we want to know how the pieces move. We want to know the possible moves. And in order to do that, we're going to have to tell Excel where the lines are, where the rows are, where the diagonals are. And I thought that's a complicated thing to do. And this is something I often do on Excel development projects. I want to test that concept, but I want to test it away from the actual file that we're developing. So move away from all that complexity into a separate file and just test the concept. And that's exactly what I did. I actually found it quite fun. So you can um, download this file and you know work along, try some of the different patterns we've got here. We've got checks here, we've got a cross, and let's go and see a diagonal. And we've got diagonal here too. So this is gonna help us when we're thinking about the movement of the chess pieces because they tend to move in lines. Now, knights don't move in lines, of course. Knights kind of move around a corner, but we're gonna come on to those later. It's a big, difficult problem. Let's deal with a manageable chunk first. I'm gonna actually take the bishops, take the bishops and see if we can, in the chess computer, see if we can begin to program those possible moves. To do that, we have to tell Excel where those diagonal cells are. And that's what I've started to do using this little fun kind of conceptual practice file that I've called Check Experiment. Use that and I've got a better idea in my head now about how we might do this. So download that file and have a look through it and what shapes can you make yourself? I'll give it a try. So I'm gonna close this file for now. Moving back to the chess file. So how are we going to get started? Well, in terms of the gameplay, if you like, I want to be able to click on one of the pieces, click on the pawn here, for example, and then the possible moves will display graphically on the board. So for example, if it's a pawn, I could click here, and then this square would color red, have a red border, and the square after would have a red border too, because they're the possible moves. So that's what we're looking to do. We're going to have to do this using a macro. So let's go, go ahead, get the Visual Basic editor, and let's begin our macro. So we've got to think where we're going to put this macro. Why don't we create a new module here? Because I'm thinking these um, macros we're going to put in now, they're to do with uh, processing moves. So we can group them all together by theme, put them in a different module that makes them easier uh, to find. So let's say insert module. You can see we've got a new module here. and I'm going to, just before setup board here, I'm going to call this capital A, setup board. That means that that module is always going to be at the top. And this one we're going to call B. And let's call it move process. That, that should do for now. We can come back and change it later. Move process. So that A and B in front of the modules there, that ensures the order of the module stays the same. I want, broadly speaking, the order of the modules to reflect how the gameplay works. So they set up the board first and then they look at possible moves. So we've got a logical order to the modules there. That's going to help us with the code, with the organization of the code. So this module, the B move process module, currently empty. So what's the first thing we do when we start off a module? Option explicit, and then we need a routine name. So let's call it possible moves. Sub first, of course, sub possible moves with the underscore there. And now we're ready to get started uh, with our macro. So I've got to think, when is this macro going to be triggered? Well, it's not going to be triggered by a button. It's not going to have a button. This macro is going to be triggered when the player clicks on the piece. So we actually want to assign this macro to each of these shapes here. And let's just do that quickly. Um, so we want to select all the shapes and assign a macro to them. How might you do that? Well, you, you can hold down the control key holding down the control key now, clicking through the shapes. I like to use this select objects uh, option, which if we go to home, and then outside of your screenshot on the right, find and select. In fact, let's bring this into the screenshot here. Um, so home, home tab, find and select all the way on the right. And then we've got an option here, which is select objects. 
That's the option we're going to use, select objects. Let's just move back to the closer view. Select objects, I know the, uh, the shortcut, uh, Alt H F D O. Alt H F D O. And now we're in this select objects mode, which can be a little bit weird. It's a bit like being in PowerPoint because we can just now high, highlight an area and all of the objects in that area are going to be selected. It's going to save you so much time uh, when you're moving objects around next time. So we can select all these objects here, uh, all of the shapes, right click. I'm going to need to hold down control, I think. Holding down the control key, right click, and then assign macro here. Which macro do we want to assign? Well, because we've got meaningful macro names, we've got possible moves there. So now the macro uh, is assigned to these shapes. Now, these shapes, when we set up the board, these shapes generate. So we've got to think about that as well. When we set up the board, we want this macro to be assigned to the shapes. How might we do that? Well, we could put that in the code, but I think there's an easier way to do it, which is just to go to these uh, shapes here. And these are the starting shapes. So these shapes are copied and manipulated into the pieces on the board. So let's just take these two shapes uh, quickly and let's assign a macro to them. Uh, control, hold down control, don't hold down control. Okay, let's do them one at a time now. Assign macro. And um, here we want the macro here. What do we want to happen? Uh, we want the possible moves macro to be assigned here. Possible moves macro to be assigned here too. So now when we regenerate the board, and let's test this now. When we regenerate the board, go to set up board. Hopefully the shapes generated should now have a macro assigned. So I just clicked the set up board macro. I'm going to right click on the shape there, assign macro. And I can see that the macro is assigned to the shape. So that means when the board is next set up, these shapes are still going to be assigned. So back in the VBA editor, let's test this quickly. Message box, possible moves. So now when I click a shape, we're expecting this macro to run. So we're expecting uh, a possible moves message box to flash up. And there's our message box. So just confirmation there that the mechanism uh, is working. OK, so what do we have to do to find these possible moves? It's like I'm delaying the difficult part. I think I am doing that a bit. Well, what, let's think simply and, and conceptually. What does the program have to know? The first piece of information is, where is the shape currently situated? Where is the shape currently situated? So we want to know which cell the piece is in, which square the piece is on, or which cell. How might we do that? You might want to stop the video and think about how you might do this. I'm not sure if it's a technique we've seen yet uh, in this series, but let's say um, we're going to need a variable, a place to store information. So let's say dim. Um, Let's say uh, current square, current square as string. Now this variable is going to store the cell, going to store the cell or the square that the piece is currently in. So how do we get that? Well, this piece of information might help. When we click on that shape, when we click on the shape, then the macro is going to run. So we could do something with application.caller. Application.caller means the shape that the name of the object that triggered the macro. Okay, let's just demonstrate this clear, uh, quickly. Message box application.caller. So if I click on a shape now, you can see W pawn five. That's because it's the name of the shape and B queen. That's because it's the name of the shape. Let's use that information, harness that information now. And let's say um, current square the variable we just created equals active sheet dot shapes. I'm going to put an underscore in here. Application dot caller dot top left cell dot address. Now I think that this that this property here, top left cell. So Excel is able to understand which cell, the position on the spreadsheet, Excel is able to understand where is this shape in relation to the grid, in relation to the cells on the spreadsheet. Super useful technique. Uh, rarely works first time, but let's give it a go. I'm going to step through the code now. 
So F8 key, to step through the code, and then what are we expecting to happen? Of course, we've got a, um, an error there. Add to shoot dot shapes, application dot caller dot type of cell dot address. Okay, right, let's see what's wrong here. Okay, let's just see if we can get application caller. Hmm. Let's see what information is in this application dot caller line of code quickly. Application dot caller. Let's just remind ourselves what do we actually get here? And okay, so F8 key. Okay, application dot Ah, I think I know what might be wrong here. Yes, so when we're using application.caller, we've got to remember to call, we've got to remember to call the macro properly. So application.caller is going to be, is going to need something to call it. So if we just step into the code like I did, debug step into, we haven't actually called the macro from an object. And the name of that object is going to be transferred to application.caller. So if you don't understand that, uh, let's give it a go. So there we go, what's happening here? Okay, nothing seems to happen there. Okay, and then let's just say, message box current square. Current square. So I think the macro just ran, but of course we're not asking it to do anything apart from allocate some information to a variable. So message box current square. So I think if, not, if, I, if I now click on something here, We've got H3 there. So I just clicked on the King's Bishop, the Black King's Bishop, and it said H3. That seems to make sense. Now I'm clicking on the Black Rook, so J3. That seems to make sense. So if we click on the King's Pawn, the White King's Pawn, we'd expect G9, because it's in cell G9, we'd expect G9 to flush up. So that seems to be working well. It wasn't the smoothest explanation, but that's the spirit of the skunk works. It's not always going to be smooth. So we've got this information allocated to this current square uh, variable. Uh, so that's a good start. So we've got this kind of anchor point. Now we want to move away from that anchor point to find the squares that are possible moves for this piece. So conceptually, this is what we're trying to do. And I'm going to use a mechanism, I'm going to use two loops, a loop within a loop to kind of scan through a square of cells. So one loop is going to move us down through the rows. And each time we go down a row, we're going to move across the column. So a loop within a loop is going to scan a square, if you like, scan a square. And then within that square, the possible moves we're going to highlight. So for the bishop, the bishop can't move to everywhere on the board. No piece can do that. The queen's the most powerful piece. Even the queen can't do that. The bishop can move diagonally. So we've got to move, uh, look through all these squares and then pick out the ones that are on the diagonal. So we need a conceptual mechanism, if you like, to tell Excel these squares are on a diagonal. Therefore, the bishop can get to these squares. So again, you might want to um, stop the video and think about how you might do that. So let's set up this uh, loop within a loop first, which is going to scan through all of the squares on the board. So we need two loops, that means two, um, two variables. So let's call one variable row counts. And these are going to be integer variables. And the other variable is column counts. Because we're going to count down the rows and then through the columns. Integer. As integer. Okay, so we've got current square. So let's um, establish these loops first. So four row counts. Counts equals one. Well, I'm actually going to say minus seven to seven. Let's give this a go. Why minus seven to seven? Well, wherever the piece is on the board, we want to be able to identify all of the available moves. So if we're talking about the rook here, the white rook, which is in the bottom right hand corner of the, of the board, the maximum number of cells away would be seven cells. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's why we're using seven and positive seven, negative seven and positive seven. Equally, if we're talking about the black rook in the top left corner, 
then the furthest away square is going to be seven uh, squares along one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it seems sensible to put those uh, to put those numbers in. Now, usually hard coded numbers in VBA are problematic, but in this case, the we're assuming anyway that the game of chess isn't going to change. So I'm happy to hard code these numbers for now. I'm going to say next row count. So you can see I've opened the loop and closed the loop at the same time. And then we're going for a loop within a loop here. So for poll count again, and it's the same dimensions, if you like, because the chessboard is a square. So the horizontal and vertical dimensions are the same. And next call count here. So we've got a loop within a loop. And now we want to test that this mechanism is, is working, this loop within a loop mechanism. What do you think the next step is? I'm going to take some water. So let's try various ways to do it, as always. Let's try this message box. And I'm going to say range current square. Square S, <laughs> basic spelling, offset, and then we're going to say, hmm, think about how to do this. I'm going to say, yeah, let's try it this way. Offset row count and call count. Let's see what happens now. This is going to be problematic because we're actually going to reference cells outside of the spreadsheet. So we're going to have to think of, we're going to have to think of a mechanism to deal with that. Let's see how this goes. So I've said to Excel, so offset is move away from. So move away from this address. And remember, we've got this address in this line of code here, the address that the piece is in effectively. Move away from this address by this number of rows. It's going to be negative seven first. And by this number of columns, which is also going to be negative seven first. So you can see we've got a danger. We might end up outside of the spreadsheet, which will, which will create an error. So we've got to avoid that. However, uh, if we begin with this rook in the bottom right corner, then I think this mechanism is going to work. Okay. So I'm just going to hit... Uh, Click the rook there and you could see, I'll, I'll just show you how I did this, sorry. You could see before I ran the code that I put a stopping point or a break point into the code here. Just click in the margin, left click. That means the code is going to stop. The code is going to stop when it gets to that square. So apologies, you would have missed some of the code I was typing that. If you download the download file, download the download file, all of the code uh, is in that. Okay, so can see most of the board, see most of the code. Just to make sure I can see all of the code. I'm going to put uh, an underscore in here. There we go. That makes it easier for your screenshots. Okay. And a break point in here. So the code is going to stop when we get there. Move back across a bit. Okay. I'm just going to hit the rook and we've stopped. So what are we expecting to happen? What's going to flash up next? So you could stop the video here. Think about what's going to flash up next. Going to hit the F8 key. It's actually said C3. Interesting. Yeah, that is right, actually. C3. So what's it done there? Let's hit OK. So the current square variable is J10. That's because the application.caller, the object that tri triggered the macro, is this shape in the bottom right-hand corner. And it's its top left cell. This shape's top left cell is uh, H10. So, so it's in cell H10. So we're starting at... Ah, J10 rather. I'm getting mixed up between the chessboard coordinates and the Excel coordinates. So we're starting in cell J10. Then we're moving away by minus seven rows. That's taking us up to row three in Excel or row eight in chess speak. And then the column count is minus seven. So it's going to take us all the way back to, to column C or column A in chess speak. So this first column uh, in on, on the board there. And that's returning, run it again, and that's returning the address of the cell, uh, which is C3. So it's saying when we're doing this scan, we're scanning the whole board for possible moves. That's, that's right for us. That's what we want. That is the furthest away square that's still on the board 
that this piece could possibly move to, but we know it's a rook, so it can't move diagonally. But if it was a queen or a bishop, then we'd want this mechanism to still work. And a queen or a bishop would, ab would be able to move diagonally to that square uh, without obstruction. So this, this looks like a good start. What do we want to happen next? Well, next we want to scan through all the squares. So if we continue going through this loop, I'm gonna just restart this routine. Then I'm going to continue going through the loop. Now I can hit the F8 key because application.caller. Uh, we clicked the shape to start the macro. Now we can uh, step through the macro and the application.caller line of code is still going to work. So F8 key to step through the macro. We've got C3 first. F8 key again. Now we've got D3. So you can see we've gone from, gone from C3 to D3. Step through again. Now we've got E3. Step through again. Now we've got F3. Okay, so we're going along the row there. I'm going to continue G3. Next one is I3. So we're currently here. Remember, don't get confused between the chessboard corners and the XL corners. Coordinates. So we're currently on I3. And let's go again. J3. Okay, so we've got to the end of the board now. Now, ideally, we'd like to go down a row. You know, we don't want to go on to K3, which I, J, K3. We want to come back to C4 just over here. Let's see what happens. Okay, we've got K3. So we've gone one too far uh, with the loop there, but I'm, I'm not going to get too bothered about that now. Let's keep going. Eight. Okay, L3. Okay, no, this does make sense. This does make sense because um, the call count, yeah, is three. The call count is going to go all the way up to seven. So we need a mechanism here to... Um, we need a mechanism to kind of stop the loop or to tell Excel that if you're outside of the range of the board, then you don't need, you know, you don't need to do anything if that makes sense. You know, you can safely ignore that. Firstly, what are we going to do with this information? I think with this information, it would be good to type it into this database here. So this database, I'm on the engine sheet now. I'm on the engine sheet in the file. Let's see if we can just type these cell coordinates onto the row that applies to this piece. And, and we said we're going to start with, we said we're going to start with a bishop. So I'm just going to write this information, uh, write these cell references onto this row here. So we've got white bishop one here, white bishop one, and white bishop one is the queen side bishop, I assume. Yeah, why bishop one is there? Okay. So, again, this is very step by step. We've got to break it down. We're not really getting close to exactly what we need to do yet, but that's okay. It's a difficult thing to do. We've got to break it down step by step. We're going to take some water here. Let's try to write this information in. So, yeah, this message box is fine, but we don't need the message box anymore. And let's say, Okay, what's the reference on the engine sheet here? So I'm just going to use a static reference for now. We can make this reference dynamic later on. So what, th this is G14. So let's start on F14 here. So sheets engine dot range F14. Yeah, range F14 equals, and I can put an underscore in here. And it's going to take that information in. Okay. However, if if we well, let's try running the macro now, and let's just see what happens here. Let's put put the offset command in two. So we just want to move one. We just want to move one column across, no rows down. So zero one. So we're expecting all of the coordinates should uh, accumulate in this cell. We're only going to see the last one because they're going to overwrite. So I'm going to save the file here, Control S, go back to the board. And then I'm going to hit, uh, yeah, let's, let's use the rook for now. We're going to transfer across to the bishop. Okay, we've, we've only got Q17 here. So Q17, uh, which is over here and down here, outside of your screenshot. Yeah, that seems to make sense because it's about seven columns of, uh, across and about seven uh, rows down. That seems to make sense. Okay, but we don't want to just overwrite these. We want to uh, put a mechanism in so so that these 
coordinates, if you like, or these range uh, addresses uh, stack up along here as we go. Let's just scroll down here a bit for your screenshot. That looks a bit better. Yeah, we just want these to stack up uh, along here. So we're going to have to use a, another variable here uh, for the position control. Let's say number of moves. Let's say number of squares. Or, or number of references, okay? <laughs> Doesn't really matter, it's gonna be a whole number variable. So integer uh, is appropriate here. And offset, dot offset, so rather than this static one here, let's have number of ref, and let's make sure number of ref equals one to begin with. Equals one, and then we want number of ref to increment up with each um, with each move or with each square input it number of ref equals number of ref plus one there we go so so we've got a, a variable here this is a tiger classic tiger youtube channel classic would say we've got a variable working with offset and a counter to move across a range dynamically what are we expecting to happen now well going back to the engine sheet We'd expect all these possible moves to kind of accumulate along here. I think we'd have 49 or 50 or 60 or so possible moves. Not all of these are actually possible because they involve moving off the board. That's what we're going to deal with next. How can we delete those moves that involve or ignore those moves that involve moving outside of the range of the board? We're going to come to that next, running a macro. So we're going to save the file and we're going to hit Rook. There we go. The code has run. Yeah, and we've got a load of cell references here. So when we were going through the message box manually using the F8 key earlier, stepping through the code, we can remember that we saw these references, C3, D3, E3, M3, blah, blah, blah. Then we move on to row four, et cetera, et cetera. How many have we got in total? Let's have a look. We've got a total of 225, so a few more than I expected. So that must be approximately 14 times 14, uh, 225. We've got all those references there. Looking at the chessboard, we know there's 64 squares. 64 on, uh, squares on a chessboard, so there can't be 225 possible moves, right? So we've got to say to Excel, uh, ignore the references that are outside the region of the board. That's what we want to say to Excel. And in our routine, somewhere in here, we've got to say to Excel, if the reference is outside of the range of the board, then just ignore this one, move on to the next one. So again, that's our coding challenge. You might want to stop the video here and stop the video and see, see how you might do that. Okay, I have some ideas uh, for doing this. Uh, firstly, let's see, do we have a named range for the board here? What have we got? White cell, anchor cell, black cell, lettuce format. Okay, this is gonna be easier if we use debug that, stop that. You see what happened there? I actually clicked on this rook in the top left-hand corner. That involved the routine looking outside of the spreadsheet. So going fewer than column A, and that returned an error. That's what we're expecting to happen. That's, that's why I've been using this rook in the bottom right-hand corner so far. So this is gonna be easier if we give a named range, if we assign the board area, give it a named range, that's going to help. That's going to simplify this, simplify this coding somewhat. We can create a bit more room here. Managing the screenshot and doing coding can be challenging, but hopefully I'm getting better at it. Hopefully it's not too frustrating. So I'm going to allocate, create a name range here. So I'm selecting the cells, selecting the board using the keyboard shortcuts. Alt. Actually, let's just let's just do it. Let's just do it the shorthand way. Let's call this board area. Board area, there we go, with the underscore and the capitalization, keep everything nice and consistent. And board area is there. I'm just gonna check that in the name manager, Alt M N. It's good to periodically open up the name manager to check the named range you've done so far. And also to do some maintenance. Sometimes you've got deleted sheets and things which cause problems with named ranges. Sometimes you accidentally uh, make a named range, um, you might assign it to, to a reference in a different file or something. It's good to periodically check through the name manager, Alt-M-N on the Windows PC, 
and just check that all of these references seem to make sense, seem reasonable. So we just created board area here. I can see that the reference uh, looks reasonable and looks accurate. Okay. So now we've got this board area uh, reference here. We can say to Excel, when you're looping through these cells, when you're looping through these code, remember this code is effectively scanning all of the possible moves, but isn't discriminating if the cell is off the spreadsheet, if it's uh, above the first column in the spreadsheet or to the left, above the first row rather, or to the left of the first column. So we need a mechanism uh, to do that. How to demonstrate this. Okay, I'm gonna create another sub at the bottom here. Uh, just to, in fact, I'll do it at the top for the screenshot just to demonstrate uh, how we might do this mechanism. So let's say check board area. I'm going to um, I'm going to delete this code in a second. It's only for, for demonstration, so I'll try to do that at the end of the, the video. First, let's check if this name range is going to work. So range board area dot select. I mean, this is how much I check stuff. Um, we created that route, that main range manually. We checked it in the name manager. Now I'm going to check if VBA can see it too. So I've checked it three times. F8 key. We've selected the board area there. So that shows us the board areas is showing. Now, what about this? We want to say to Excel, select the first cell in the range. Select the first cell in the range. And we've got a named range with multiple rows and columns in. So how might we do that? Select the, select the first cell in the range. Okay, I've got some ideas. So we can use the cells method here. Okay, let's see what happens now. So I'm saying to Excel, look at the board area named range, which has multiple cells in. Now this dot cells one one is going to select the top left cell. It's gonna look at that named range and it's going to select the cell that is uh, one row down and one column into the range. So effectively, it's going to select the top left cell. Dot cells is a little bit like offset. It's to do with position control. The One of the critical differences that often confuses people is that if you say offset dot zero, offset zero, zero, it effectively keeps you in the same place with cells. We've got to say one one cell zero zero doesn't work. So with cells, often you're using one number higher than you would with offset. Not a great explanation, but you might store that way in your mind and kind of work it out later. Hopefully, it might help. Anyway, let's see what we're talking about here. Hitting the F8 key, we can see the top left cell has been selected. Let's do some play just to prove the concept. Hitting the F8 key, and the second cell is selected. I can see just in your screenshot here. I can see that cell D4 is selected. So what about the final cell in this range? Now we could do something funky, like saying to Excel, because um, Excel knows the number of rows in this range. I'll just demonstrate this quickly. Message box, uh, range board area. Area dot rows dot count, I think. Let's see how we do with this. Okay, eight. Good. So we could say we could drop this line of code into, into the cells uh, method here. And that would mean if board area were to get bigger, if we were add to, to add rows to the range, then this code would still work. This code would still be valid. It has a certain dynamic quality. However, we're talking about a chessboard we're talking about a chessboard. Sometimes you can make assumptions, and in this case, we can assume that the chessboard is going to remain the same size. So I'm just going to get rid of this for now. Uh, board area, and I'm looking to select the final cell, cell uh, J10, or reference H1 in chess terms, hitting the F8 key, and I can see, yeah, you can just see that in your screenshot that uh, the bottom right hand corner of the board is selected so it's super powerful this sales method the sales method works with a with a sheet so you could say uh sheets board not cells to do a reference it also works with ranges named ranges super powerful technique good so how is this code actually going to help us well i'm gonna uh cut it down here 
But now I'm going to use that construct somehow. It's going to switch to a different view here. Okay, that's slightly better. So I can delete this as well. Here we go. Okay, this will do for now. So at this point in, in the code, remember this line of code here, it looks like three lines of code. It's only one line of code because so I've used the underscores there. This line of code is inputting on the engine sheet, inputting the cell references there on row 14. So this looks good. Um, but uh, what we want to do is, what we want to do is say to Excel, rather than doing that, we want to say to Excel, only do it if that reference is part of the board. So we could say in coding terms, if, well, let's try to write it down uh, in coding terms. So let's say if, okay. Okay, here we are. Right. So this is our, our cell of interest, if you like. So we can say if, the column dot column okay let's do a quick test with the message box here check the information is going through properly okay we've got three there that's because c3 is the third column in the spreadsheet so as always just using the message box there to check that the information is going into uh, VBA as, as, as we'd expect. So this is the column here. Right, let's do it logically. Let's, let's test the row first. Test is row inside board area. Okay, I'm going to make this easier by, although we're running out of room a bit on the screenshot here. I hope, you, I hope you can get a feel for what's going on. Remember the download file is available. All of the code is there in the download file. Let's say dim board, board first call. Mm. Okay, we might end up with four variables actually. <laughs> and let's say integer here. And let's say board last call. or last call as integer. I mean, this approach might be a bit um, text heavy, might be a bit code heavy. Maybe you can think of a better way to do this. I'm just gonna go with it for now. And then let's say board first row as integer, board last row as integer. So we've got four integer variables there. Okay, let's save a line here. Let's save another line here. So we want to put information into these variables to do with the dimensions of the board, effectively. So how are we going to do this? Well, this line of code that we've been using, I'm going to take that out of the loop now. I'm going to assign this information to a variable, which should hopefully simplify the approach, but I'm not absolutely sure. Let's see how it goes. Tap this back across, make sure the indentation is consistent. Okay. Let's start with board first row. I'm going to deal, deal with the rows first, try to keep it consistent. So let's reflect that in the order in which we declare the variables. So board first row equals, okay, this line of code, I'm actually going to use. Here we are. Okay, so board first row equals, yeah, I'm just thinking of whether I need to specify the sheets here, but this code is always going to be uh, triggered by clicking on the pieces, so we can assume we're going to be on the board sheet, that's going to save us, uh, so, so equals range um, board area dot cells. One one dot right. Okay. I'm going to recycle this. So board last row. Oh, 
problem. And you might be able to hear my dog is actually snoring. We've got a new dog here. She's with me uh, today and she's actually snoring at the moment. She's having a good time in her uh, basket. We'll try and introduce her in future uh, videos. Okay, this looks good. Although English spelling, always a struggle. There we go. Okay, so board first row, board last row. Copy paste these, control C, control V, board first call. And board last call. Okay, so this is the last cell in the range. Got eight rows, eight columns, eight files, eight ranks uh, on a chessboard. Uh, so there we go, looks good. I'm just gonna put a bit of a bit of a bonus in here if you like. But I'm trying to I'm trying to abbreviate my code. I'm trying to use less code really. And we can do that by putting a little with ends with in here. Board underscore area. Okay, and now we can get rid of all of these range board areas. Get rid of U2. Get rid of U2. Get rid of U2. Okay. Just a bit less code to read. Now that doesn't look like much of a difference, but when you're tired and debugging, it makes, makes a big difference to not have to look at so much code. Let's put an indentation there, just to make it more obvious what's going on. Okay, good. So we've got the dimensions of the board now allocated to variables there. So what are we going to do? We're going to test it. Uh, so again, just clicking on a piece there, put in, put in the breakpoints. So what have we got? We've got three there because the first row is the first row of the chessboard, is the third row in the spreadsheet, always confusing. Board last row is, okay, that should be board last. Okay, yeah, and I haven't quite got it right. Hopefully you spotted that. Eight, eight, and then last row, it says a row. There we go. Um, first call. Okay, yeah. Seem to sort that out there. So again, checking the checking through the code here. Board first row is three. Board last row is ten. Seems to make sense. First column is three, and last column is ten. So it seems to make sense. We can see the variables actually the same there. We can see that the values of the variables is the same because of the way we've positioned the board, because it starts the same number of rows down as columns across. The variables are the same, but let's not assume that happens in the future. We want to set it up so we can move the board anywhere else on, on this sheet and most of the code, hopefully all of the code would still work. That's a proper dynamic approach. Okay, so all of these variables um, have values allocated to them. So what are we going to do next? Okay, so we need a line of code down here. And it's going to be quite a long line of code up there. Oops, um, okay, bring it up nicely into your screenshots. Okay, to the cross. Okay. So we've got four rules to test, if you like. So first, is the row of the cell we're looking at. Remember, we're scanning all these cells in a big square and then trying to pick out the cells that are on the board and then the cells that the piece can actually move to. So we're trying to pick out the ones on the board. So if the row of the uh, cell we're looking at is less than the first row in the board first row, then that cell is above the, effectively above the board. So we want to discount it. Then, hmm. okay, I'm going to do this with a variable. We, we could link these all together. Let's try linking them all together first. Then if it doesn't, it doesn't work out, we're going to do this using a variable because it's clearer. Okay. Cut. I'm, I'm going to try it with a single rule first. Mm -hmm. Left than board first row, then we want to include less than board first row. Okay, here comes the new dog. Here comes the new dog. Sit, darling. Doing a sit. Come on. 
Come on, do a sit. Oh, you don't want to sit. Come on, do a sit. Come on, sit. Is it because you've just woken up? You like that. You're going to lie down there. Chill out. Okay. So if the row this we're looking at is less than, then we then we do want to include it. Okay. We want to go to end it here. And if and this is now an if statement here. And if we want to end on this properly, good. You can see we're saying we're saying here if the ray if the row of the cell we're scanning is less than the first row in our board, then we want to exclude it. So in fact, we should say it's more than or equal to here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, because if the yeah, the row of the square we're looking at is more than or equal to the uh, first row of the board, then we want to include that. I think I think that's how, how the logic should work. Now let's try running the code just with that one rule. And let's see, let's see if this works. Okay, so before we had two, take that back, before we had 255 combinations. So we're expecting a, a, a reduction in the, in the number of combinations here. I'm going to click the pawn here. Before I was using the rook, now I'm going to click the pawn. So the, um, the cells in row two, effectively, it's going to, in the scan, it's going to include the cells in row two. We'd expect them to be excluded. So I'm going to click pawn now. And let's see what's happened here. So now we've got 210. We've got 210 entries here. And we can see we don't have anything from row two, which suggests to me uh, that this has worked. So this looks good. So let's um, improve the code here. So we want the second rule here. I'm going to just copy this rule down and make some changes to it. Okay, so let's use the board last row. And less than or equal to, equal to board last row. Okay, so board last row, yeah, that's the name of the variable, board last row. So I just reversed the notation there, changed um, more than to less than. Okay, okay, good. So now we're expecting to eliminate some more cells. So previously, how many cells did we get? Previously, we got 210 cells. So that was a reduction of 45 cells, I think. So we're expecting another 45 cells to be eliminated at this point. So again, I'm going to use the pawn here. In fact, it should be more than 45 cells this time. Let's see what happens. Okay, back in the engine now. I didn't clear this information, I don't think. So let's clear this. And then run the code again, click on the piece to run the code. There we are. Okay, how many have we got here now? So now we've got 120, I've now got 120 cells. So you can see how we're gradually, um, gradually eliminating those, those references that we don't need, just very systematically, steady, slow, systematic. That's the best way to code. Try to avoid errors as well when you code. So again, I'm gonna copy paste. This line of code, going to need an underscore here. When you end up doing these long conditional statements, which isn't really preferable, I think there might have been a better way to do this, then you've got to be very careful with your syntax. Okay. So now we're talking about col board first col. Board first col, and now we want the column property of the cell we're scanning, not the row property. Let's then board first call. Yes, I think, uh, there we go, more than, yes. So if it's more than that first column that we specified in the variable, then we want this to happen. Seems to be okay. So again, I think, I think we're just gonna eliminate, eliminate a couple this time. We had 120 last time, didn't we? So let's try it. Maybe we won't eliminate any at all. Okay, we've still got 120 now. I think that's expected. But I'm not absolutely sure. OK, 
Yeah, right. Let's put the last. Um, let's just complete this. And then we'll assess if it's looking good or not. <laughs> And it might, may take some debugging. Hope you'll stay with me till the bitter end if that's the case. This is all last call now. And again, just following the pattern, switch this round. Then we've got to make sure this is column. Board first call, board last call. Board first row, board last call, call. Board last row, board first call, board last call. And then look at the notation there. This seems to be okay, right. So now let's see what's happening. Okay, so let's start with this pawn again. What's happened here? Of course, I've got to clear these out first. Get this pawn again, okay. Now we've got 64. Now, 64 seems to make sense because we've got 64 squares on a chessboard. Now, that doesn't mean that the pawn has 64 possible moves, it's just saying there's 64 references that the pawn could possibly, the pawn could possibly move to. Okay, let's try this one more time, c3, d3, e3, etc, etc. So now whatever whatever piece we click on, click on the rook down here, but expect that to still be 64. We've still got 64 here. I'm just using the control shift key, hold, holding down control shift there to get this done. And let's try another piece. Let's try the queen here. Okay, let's see what's happened. Hmm, interesting, interesting. They don't work with the queen now. Let's try that one more time. Let's clear these out quickly. Okay, we're going to we're gonna have to debug this. Yeah, debug. Right. Current square is F3. Yeah, that seems to make sense. Board first row three, board last row 10, board first call three, board last call is 10. Okay. Right, I think I see, I think I see what's going on here. Okay, right. So what's the value of row count is minus seven. So we're saying to Excel, yeah, we want you to go um, off the board uh, effectively. Okay, right. Hmm, how to fix this one then? Let's fix this one. Low. Hmm. Okay. That would seem to make sense. Looks like reference is taking it off the board. So we're gonna have to think of a new approach here, I think. Um, can we do an approach just using variables here yeah what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna try to do is let's use we're gonna have to restructure this sorry it's gonna make the video a bit longer but we'll try to get to the bottom of this so let's say if it's gonna have to be where the cell is hmm okay Okay then. Right, I'm gonna take a bit of thought. Okay. Okay, let's try this. Change current square. Uh, dot. Let's use rows first. Minus. Let's say plus. Row count is less than <laughs> zero. Okay, does not equal, uh, is more than zero then. Okay, yeah, I think we're going to have to. Right, okay. Now these rows, these rules are going to commit them out. So let's see if we can rebuild this. I'm going to rebuild these with reference to the um, 
with ref by referring to the black pieces, the black pieces appear to be problematic because they're at the top of the board there. I think what's happening is Excel is, is referring outside of the range of the spreadsheet with, uh, with these lines of code. Remember, these variables have negative values. So if we're starting in cell F3 in the spreadsheet and we have offset minus seven, that's gonna take us outside of the range of the spreadsheet. So that's gonna create the, uh, the error there. Hopefully this is not, because th this is some simple ar an arithmetic calculation. Excel won't mind if this is less than zero, but it uh, tells us if we're outside of the, um, of the spreadsheet there. Okay, right, so again, I'm going to switch off this if statement altogether. But now we should be back to, I think it's something like 255 combinations here. Okay. Let's clean out this row again. That row is clear. And let's try, let's see what happens. Okay, we've got uh, an error again. Set. Okay. Yes. Of course, that's not going to work. Hmm. Okay, right, well, I'm going to put a variable in. I'm going to put another variable in to try to simplify this to make it easy, easier for me. Exclude. Let's just exclude cell as Boolean. Okay. And we're going to say, we're going to set this new Boolean variable to true. And then we're going to put some if statements in here to make it false if we don't want Excel to look at this row. Now, this is going to take a long conditional statement and make it, make it into four short conditional statements. Now, that has the benefit of making it easier to debug. You could see... When there's an error with that long conditional statement, eight lines with the with the underscores creating new lines, but eight lines there, that's difficult to understand. So I'm going to break it down into smaller statements and then see if see if we can get it working more smoothly. Okay. Okay, and then we're going to say here. Yeah. So if exclude cell underscore cell equals true then equals yeah we're going to do that. <laughs> let's get the falses and trues right here exclude cell, cell equals false and then if the exclusion rule is met we want that to be true so if it excludes cell, cell equals false then then let's use this end if which we've got left over from previous uh, conditional statements there Okay, let's indent u in. Let's indent u in as well. Let's have some indentation here. There we go. Okay, so this long rule, I said I'm going to translate, convert into four smaller rules. Again, I'm going to uh, recycle this code here. So control C, control V, control V, and control V there. Okay. Right. Less than zero. This row count is so the first row is going to be if if the first rule here is going to be if the row of the cell we're looking at is less than the first row on the board, so it's all the first row. Okay. And then board last is more than board last row here. Sorry, the quality of the commentary has deteriorated somewhat. That's because I'm having to think quite hard about this. More than board last row, then we want to exclude the cell. And the same thing with the columns. Okay, dot column here and dot column here. Okay, and this is going to be call count. 
called found here. It's a whole first row. It should be less than. This is, yep, it's poll count. It's more than board uh, last poll. And this should, of course, this variable should, of course, be column here. Okay, so hopefully this is fairly clear. But now I've got. Now I've got four small conditional statements. My chances of understanding what's going on. Let's just bring this right across so you can see. Now I've got four conditional statements. Hopefully the chances of, of understanding what's going on are going to be higher. You should be able to do the debugging here. Okay, so I'm going to step through. I'm going to hit the queen again. Then I'm going to step through here just to see what's going on. So hit the queen there. Okay, so current square dot row is three that's because the queen is on the third row in the spreadsheet board first row is three so we don't but row count is minus seven yeah so it's going to take three it's going to take seven away gives minus four negative four board first row is three so we're going to be excluded excluding it on that basis okay let's, let's uh hit the code again so exclude cell hovering over the uh, ho hovering over the um, variable here. I can see that the variable of exclude cell is false, and then it's going to go to true now. There we go. So it's now true. That means we don't go into this conditional statement. Okay. Now that should avoid the errors. Right. So let me check through these again. Less than, more than, yes, less than, call. Okay, being reasonably confident now, but we never know. Okay, so we're still expecting the sales to be written in uh, on this uh, engine sheet. Good, let's try it. Right, didn't see anything happen. We have got some sales here. How many sales have we got? Okay, we've got 64 sales. That is what we'd expect because there's 64 sales uh, on the chessboard there. So we'd expect that to happen. Okay, let's try a different piece there. Okay, let's try a piece down here. Let's try the pawn. What have we got? 64 again. That's good. Let's just clear these out this time. Let's go for another piece here. Bottom left, the rook. And again, yes, we've got all of the got all of the cells there. Okay. So that mechanism seems to be working. So be, being able to list all of the being able to list all of the cells, the cell references rather, the Excel cell references of all of the cells on the board, regardless of where the board goes. That's the main benefit of this, of this approach. Uh, if the board were to move somewhere else, uh, then this approach would still work because of the dynamic mechanisms we've got in the code. And let's just go through them here. Yeah, the dynamic mechanism here. So this is saying the first row of the board is the first row of that board first row range of the board area range row. So that board area range uh, that we can see up here, it's going to select it now. It's got the board area range here. So wherever this range goes, you can see board area in the top left. Wherever this range goes, this code should still work. So it's kind of a dynamic approach uh, in that sense. Now we had to work through these conditional statements a couple of times. Uh, because, yep, the first approach didn't quite work because we were getting to a cell outside of the spreadsheet and Excel didn't, didn't like that. But in the end, uh, it seems to work pretty well. And, yeah, we've got all of the uh, possible moves there, which kind of, looks, kind of looks a bit disappointing because it's only really a list of the cell references. But as I said, if the board were to move, then those cell references would change, so we can't assume that those cell references are static, that those cell references are going, to make, are going to remain the same. We've assumed they might change. It gives the user flexibility to put the, to put the board uh, somewhere else. Okay, so that's as far as we're going to go uh, in this video. Um, hope, hope you're enjoying the, um, the, the Skunk Work series. And um, yeah, that was definitely hard work, that video. You saw me get into trouble. Uh, you saw me kind of kind of work through it. And uh, one thing you can be sure about if you're doing computer programming, 
things are going to go wrong at some point. But what we can control is approaching those problems in a rational, step-by-step -step way, uh, doing things um, like organizing the code properly, putting some annotations in the code. I only had a few today, stepping through the code, hovering over variables, having all of those debugging skills ready to help us uh, should things go wrong. So hopefully you've been able to see that uh, in this video. And yeah, won't go any further with this video, but next video, what are we looking at? Well, going to be looking at, we've now got this board defined and um, we can see which squares we can go to, uh, if we can move to any possible square, that is. So we want to now think, okay, a bishop can only move diagonally. You remember, this was the original aim of the video, but things always, things always crop up, don't they? Uh, which make things more complicated. Uh, yeah, but we want to click on the bishop and the bishop would just have the diagonal squares, for example, and the rook would just have the squares in a straight line. So that's going to be the next part of the Spreadsheet Skunt Works uh, series. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, if you've liked it, if you got to the end, well done. Uh, if you've liked it, I hope you learned something, give it a thumbs up. And uh, I'll see you in, in another video on the channel and the next video in the Spreadsheet Skunk Works series. Take care.